podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hey everybody, welcome to Smart People Podcast. This is Chris. And this is John. Got a little treat today, more so for us as podcasters. Yeah, I think for the two of us, we might have geeked out. But it is awesome episode, and it was a listener recommendation, which we always love when you guys send us people to talk to, and then they turn out being awesome and smart. Today we speak with Brian Dunning, who does the Skeptoid Podcast. That's not the only thing he does or has done in his life. We talk a little bit about his business that he started straight out of college that ended up being like a million, multi, I mean, a huge company he turned it into and then came crashing down, which I love those stories because you always learn something from them. But Brian is hands down one of the top 10 podcasters. I don't, did I make that up completely? You, you might have made it up, but it's pretty damn close. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's up there. Yeah. He gets a ton, of, a ton of downloads, runs a great show. And he's one of the original, I mean, he's one of the original podcasters. Dude, you know he's what he an is? OG. OG, which is, is my favorite term because yeah. I don't know if I knew what that meant when I was like 12, but I would hear it in rap songs. Oh, yeah. And we'd always call people OGs. Yeah. And, parents would be like, don't listen to that stuff. And I'd wear my starter jacket. But you know what's cool is Brian, he really fits with the flow of our show. I mean, his whole podcast is based around, and I'm going to say it because it's on Wikipedia, but debunking, debunking myths. And then in the same time, he teaches you some insight. Like he says in the interview, he doesn't just take away and tell you what's fake. He tells you also what's real. Sure. And I mean, I had to do some gushing during the interview because in preparation, I listened to more than a handful of his episodes. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't just, oh, this isn't true. It was, hey, learn A, B, and C and be a smarter person now. And he gets you fired up because you realize how we're lemmings. You have to listen to this podcast, not, you know, Smart People Podcast, to learn some things. And you can throw in Skeptoid in your rotation and read a few books, maybe, and turn off the TV and really try to soak in what's true versus what is, you know, marketable. So that's what we're all about here. But so we're going to turn it over to Brian. As you know, we have to do some things first. So yeah. I don't know. John, go ahead. It's holiday season. It is and holiday season. We need season. to mention our partner. I'm calling them a partner now. Amazon. You might have heard of them. Yeah, you might have heard of them. Anyways, head over to the website, www.smartpeoplepodcast.com. Amazon banner is at the top of the page. Click that. Do your normal shopping. Put a few pennies in our pocket. Help us out. Holiday shopping's upon us. Be nice to everybody. Be nice to Smart People Podcast. Yeah, and if you have ad blocker, it might not show up. So there's an Amazon tab titled Amazon tab. So you can go there as well. And all the other things, check us out, Facebook, Twitter, newsletter. I don't even care. I'm not going to get into that too much anymore. Thank you to everyone who voted for us on the podcast awards. The voting's over, so we won't be asking you to do that anymore. We're just moving on to telling you to give us your money. I got nothing left. I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Great guy, Skeptoid Podcast. We'll catch you in a few. The first thing that that I wanted to ask was, I took a look at your background and I know it looked like you co-founded a a pretty big company and you were the CTO, I believe it was. And I was wondering how you got into podcasting from there. It seemed like an interesting (laughs) transition. I actually went to school for computer science and uh, writing for film and television. Never worked in either field. <laughs> when podcasting came along, it was the, you know, it's, it's kind of the perfect combination of all of my interests. It's, a, it's, it's an entertainment program. It's scientific. It's, it, you know, I, I get to do all the website and background stuff. So that satisfies my, my male programming urge. And um, as far as how I got there from working in the internet thing, that was, that was kind of a whole adventure. That was a, right in the middle of the whole dot-com boom of the uh, late 90s. And it was actually a, a company that my brother and I had founded from our garage t-shirt business, which we were doing while, while we were in college. Here's how to stay alive and pay the bills during the college years. We're printing t-shirts in our garage. You are kidding me. No. 
that's no, I, it's funny literally because screen printing. I screen printed maybe six months ago. I was like, hey, we should do this on the side. Me and a friend of mine started, and then I left. <laughs> I, I spent six years doing that. It was wow. hell. <laughs> wow. And uh, it, the business was just successful enough that I couldn't quit, right. but not, was never able to make to even make a living. But we decided that we liked the, um, the technology end of it more than the screen printing end of it. This was like mid '90s, so the mm -hmm. this whole internet thing was just starting to appear. So we decided we'd make what we called an online trade show, where vendors could list their stuff that they have available, and retail store buyers could come and find stuff to stock their stores with. Kind of an obvious idea now, but it was pretty revolutionary back then. Wow! And that's... so that's something that we ran out of a server in the closet at my house for, God, three four years, and. It was doing great. It was making us some money, and we thought it was wonderful. But then all of a sudden, the, the venture capital companies came knocking, and we started getting deluged with all these offers of venture capital. And okay. I got to stop you there. Now, now I just I'm going to take this that way because I didn't know that, I didn't know this whole background. So you mid '90s, you are a computer guy. You understand this whole industry at the time, and yes. you say. You know what? I got an idea. We're going to basically be an online wholesaler. Is that right? We weren't a wholesaler. We were functioning just like a trade show. So the, 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 the customers were, were buyers for retail stores, and the people who were selling on it were um, the vendors, people, the manufacturers, okay. people like, like ourselves in our T-shirt days, mostly larger companies than that, obviously. Right. So uh, the, the idea was we would make money on both ends, the the manufacturers would pay a fee to be, have their products listed, and the retail store buyers would pay a fee to have access, just like at a trade show. Wow! So, uh, yeah, that's that's that was um, it was a great idea for something that had the the expenses of two guys in one closet. It was not so great of an idea for something that had uh, an office and thirty employees and oh. you know two hundred thousand dollars of monthly expenses. So really, it was a it was a terrible idea to take the venture capital. <laughs> wow! So you did end up taking some venture capital, and and then it didn't. Yeah, didn't... you see, we 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 weren't really even aware of the whole venture capital industry, right? Um, and yeah, you know, this whole dot com thing, we just didn't even know about it. It just wasn't part of our worldview. And guys would we start getting these term sheets in the email saying, hey, you know, uh, four million dollars for this, five million dollars for that, and. We actually turned down a deal to sell the entire company for ten million dollars. That was in um, probably ninety eight. That is, and brutal. I still kick myself in the butt for <laughs> yeah, that every that's single brutal. day. And so, what ended up happening with it? Well, like I said, it was a great. It, it, the The business was great to support the small costs of two guys, but it couldn't withstand the costs. Right. So as soon as the venture capital company poured money into it, and we thought, great, let's spend all this money, then the company was went from being in the black to in the red, and when it got far enough in the red, they uh, pulled the plug and basically liquidated it. Wow. And it killed the service for the people who loved it. The customers really loved it, and it of course took our business away and. So it was just a horrible decision, but you know, you live and learn. Yeah. And the thing is, we talk to a lot of entrepreneurs on this podcast. And one of the things I've heard a lot about, I read it in this book that I just read called Rework. It talks about don't grow too fast. Don't always be concerned with growing. It's not about taking on money and getting bigger. If you're small and it's working, that's good enough. Have, do you think about that at all now or hindsight 2020? Yeah, that's that's absolutely the number one lesson that we learned because this idea was new for our industry as well. And just because our company suddenly had higher monthly expenses, it didn't mean anyone was going to be more interested in being our customer. Right. right. So the business was not able to grow as fast as the venture capital made us able to grow. Sure. So, I mean, it was all the all the wrong decisions were made. Okay, so now you're young, you've you've done the entrepreneurial thing, you had your highs, you had your lows, and what's next after that? Yeah, you know, that was a super, super stressful time, especially as it was all falling apart around us and, you know, people losing their jobs and layoffs and all of this stuff. And that was all new for me. And that was something that I was just very poorly equipped to deal with. And so 
I just kind of reacted by crawling into a hole. And I went back to something I'd been doing way in the early days, which was just basic independent consulting, just sitting there and doing programming for people on a contract basis, which was easy, relaxing, reasonably lucrative, supported my family great. And that's pretty much what I did through really through about uh, two years ago when the podcast grew to the point that uh, that it really demanded full-time attention and was, you know, almost able to support the same attention. So I'm not making the same mistake. I'm, yeah. I'm not going out looking for investors now for my podcast. No, you know, and you laugh, but I mean, we've been doing this podcast now for two years and obviously we'll dive into yours, but it's fun. It's a blast, but there's no, it's tough to find money. I mean, it's, oh, it's yeah. tough to make it a living. I don't even know how that's possible. So, you know, you think, oh, I wouldn't take investors, but if somebody came knocking on our door, I don't know if we'd be like, no, 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 we're too good for that. <laughs> no, I mean, there's nobody making content investments anymore. There, exactly. That was happening, what, maybe three years ago. Mm -hmm, um, yeah. There were some kind of experimental content investments and they've, uh, there's a great little anecdote that I just read about uh, maybe a week ago. I forget what company this was, but it was one of the major studios who had thrown tens of millions of dollars at making some web series. And in the whole history, they produced a whole season and they got, you know, like 700,000 views on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> and then Justin Bieber throws up on stage. And gets 14 million <laughs> views <Yep>. overnight. <laughs> you can't predict it. I yeah, mean, you still yes. know. And so they're saying, you know, throwing tens of millions of dollars at this is not the way to to make a, a web series successful. No, that's true. Google actually just did that on YouTube where they were giving out all these grants to different content providers for their, you know, popular YouTube channels. And I just read something that they're like scaling back 80% of those funds because they essentially flushed a lot of the money down the toilet to see what actually stuck. Mm -hmm. But it just kind of seems like a crapshoot now in terms of what people actually want to watch. I mean, it does seem like people just want to see Justin Bieber throwing up and yeah. kitten videos. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 still a, a, a business idea that's in its infancy. You know, it's it's maturing somewhat as far as the content and how people listen to it, how people prefer to have it delivered, what kinds of shows they like. But as far as turning it into a business model, it's um, it's not there. Well, let's discuss that a little, a little bit. I mean, John and I talked about in the intro, your podcast, Skeptoid, and it's really phenomenal. It is is clearly uh, well done. You've been doing it for a long time. The premise being you get on and you talk about common misconceptions, if you will, things to be skeptical about, obviously. Where did that come from? I mean, were you just sitting home going, you know what? Uh, there's a lot of crap that people need to know, and I'm going to be the guy to tell them. No, no, I, I never had the idea that that I I know all kinds of things that people want to know. What how it came about was back in two thousand six, I happened to learn that there was such a thing as a podcast, and I just I'm browsing through iTunes and found a couple and listened to a couple and said, man, these are really great. I really enjoy this. I want to make one. Again, going back to what I said at the beginning, just because it was the perfect confluence of all of my you know, by, by core com competence areas and my interests. So I had, I don't know, half a dozen pet peeves. And the first five or 10 episodes of Skeptoid were just pet peeves of mine. And I was fortunate in that I made a number of decisions in terms of how I was going to do the presentation that turned out to be very valuable in the long run, which was it's a short format. They were only five or 10 minutes long now. They're a little bit longer now. They're about 12 minutes long on the average. So it's something that listeners are not intimidated by. They say it's, it's not a huge investment to listen sure. to a Skeptoid episode. It's short. Um, the other thing that, uh, that I did was that they were written in advance, which gave me the ability to have, to have it on a web page, have a transcript on the web page without having to hire someone in India to make the transcript for me. Hmm. And as a result, they're fantastic Google bait because they're very high value pages. It's all original content. It's it's a great a thorough discussion of the subject matter and there's no BS black hat search engine stuff going on. Mm -hmm. So they're very good Google pages. And for some reason, um, these first five or 10 episodes that I made, which I intended to be the only ones I was gonna make, um, 
for some reason that was just good luck for me, people responded to it and people really enjoyed it. Uh, a lot of people said, oh, you've got a great radio voice. Well, you know, that's just good luck for me, I guess. <laughs> um, and people enjoyed the presentation. Now, I've, I've always been a I've always been a, a, in creative writing. I went to school for it. I did a lot of it as a little kid. Um, I spent a number of years wasting my life trying to sell screenplays in Hollywood in my <laughs> 20s. Uh, so so um, it just it just worked out really well for me to make the show in this fashion. And like I say, good luck for me that uh, so many people enjoy listening to it. You know, I, I've just been able to really dive in and really – hone my research skills and and the, the the storytelling skills and really make each episode into, you know, ideally really make each episode into a, a nice little show that works. Was it also good luck that the pages became great Google bait or did you realize beforehand, I know that this is going to be a powerful tool? Because, I mean, 2006, SEO was really just starting to take off and people starting to get their hands around it and that kind of stuff. I mean, did you realize that you were going to be driving traffic to your podcast this way or did it just was it happenstance and then you took advantage of it no that was that was not happenstance at all um that was one of the things that i learned from um from our from bylink the the company was i was talking about Mm -hmm. um was we had boy i don't remember hundreds of thousands of product pages on on the website and we needed to make those search engine bait so that was something that i had a, a fair amount of experience in okay um how to do it well, what's the difference between, you know, an actual good quality web page and crap that's made to feed the spiders. And um, I, 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 I very well knew the difference and the value of making good quality pages. So that was, that was a deliberate decision on my part. You got past your first six to ten episodes of things that just annoy you. Now, how do you vet these topics? I mean, John and I were just talking, one of my favorites is a recent one where you talk about cleanses. And, Mm -hmm. well, I want to dive into that, but one question at a time. First question is, how do you come to find these topics that are so intriguing? Well, by now, and I've been doing it six years, 338 episodes. Wow. um, And uh, by now, people send me ideas far faster than I'm ever able to keep up with. That's true. (laughs) And within the first maybe 20 episodes... I had really zeroed in on what kind of a show it was and what it's about and what the subject matter is. And that's basically things in pop culture that a lot of people believe that are not true, but that there's a more interesting you know, fact behind, um, that there's more interesting science. Cases where when you stop at the pop culture explanation of something like you know, there's a ghost in the lighthouse or there's a mysterious force in the Bermuda Triangle – and you stop investigating at that. You just decide, oh, there's something paranormal. You're actually missing out on going all the way and learning what actually is causing whatever these strange reports are. Or as we often find is the case, that there is no strange report, that the whole thing was made up. Hmm. So that's what it's about. It's a general science show explaining the general science behind whatever the phenomenon is. So it requires a good solid week of immersion in research. Um, and so that's why I kind of have to do it full time. Even though it's a short show, there's a phenomenal amount of work and research that goes behind each one. Isn't it amazing how much work goes into a podcast? Like, <laughs> I recently wrote a newsletter about that, and I was just saying, you know, you might not believe us, but this takes a lot of effort. <laughs> like, I can't yeah. explain it. Yeah. When I started, it was something I was able to do on the side. Uh, I would do it early in the morning or at night. Well, I've got a family. I can't take time out of family time in the evening, so I'm having to get up super early. And I needed to spend a full day of work. And it became clear that if the show is going to be good quality, it requires a full-time commitment. And so that was when I set about trying to find ways that, you know, I could could, uh, make a living from it. Did you realize that one of the biggest benefits for you was just being consistent? I mean, that's what we're kind of figuring out is, you know, put put out a show every week that people rely on. You build that base and and that's your thing. And you've been doing it for, like you said, six years. I mean, I can't imagine the base and the camaraderie that you've built with your listeners. It's it's consistency is a huge factor. Skeptoid comes out every Tuesday, California time at 7 a.m., in six years, I've only missed one episode, and it was because my sister died. And 
when I started, I, I was doing them every four days, which is random. And then I did them every five days. And then I hired, I had a PR person that I hired kind of in the early days, just kind of floundering, looking for how to make this more successful. And that was one of the tips that they gave me is make it a weekly show. I know it's fewer shows, but weekly is so much better than an oddball schedule, like four days or five days. And I found that that consistency is extremely key. It not just consistency of how often the show is released, but the length of each show, the content of each show, the style of presentation of each show. Uh, you want your listeners to, you, you know, it's like it's like a TV series. Mm -hmm. Every TV series, it's got the same characters, the same sets, the same blah 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 blah. You know, Friends, Seinfeld, whatever it is, it is consistent, and that's so important. So my shows are all the same length. They're all close to the same length. They're all presented in the same kind of boring, dry manner that's, that, that I've become known for, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works. <laughs> no, it's funny, and, and I know you just made us look bad, too, because John and I, we try, but it's tough to be consistent when you have a, a whole other world going on. So we're like, it'll be every Sunday, and then we'll miss it one, and we'll be like, um, we were busy. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, my, my show is low resource because there's only one person, just that's me. True, yeah. You know, a, a lot of my... In fact, virtually all the other podcasts that I know, I'm, I'm good friends with many other podcasters, mm -hmm. and virtually all of them have a, a whole crew of people. Right. There's no way that a show is ever going to be able to pay for that many salaries. Oh, yeah. So that means everyone has to do it on the side. Yeah. No, no one's able to give it the, the real dedication that it needs. So let's talk a little bit more about these topics that you cover. And like you said, 12 to 15 minutes, it's just you. It's very well researched. And I wanted to see, as you've done all of this research, you've obviously become kind of a jack of all trades. Have you taken any things away? Like when you do this every time, do you see any uh, recurring themes? Oh my gosh, this is happening again in another scam or whatever it might be. Yeah, um, uh, certainly. Um, it's, it's easy to sell people just about anything you want to sell them. And <laughs> really what people buy is miraculously easy solutions. If you look at anything that's a trend, whether it's, you know, you mentioned the cleansing episode, whether it's organic food, whether it's um, you can miraculously speak to your dead relatives, these are all magically easy solutions that we'd all love for them to be true. But the fact is the world just doesn't provide magically easy solutions. You know, so I've kind of got the task of throwing a wet blanket on everything and being the party pooper. You know, no, you can't give yourself super health by taking this supplement or or whatever it is that that people want to do. You know, there's actually hard work involved in being healthy or or whatever problem you're trying to solve. So, my, what my job is is to find the more interesting angle so that my show is giving the listeners something rather than just trying to take something away. You know, it's it's often described as a debunking show, and I I, I would hate to think that that's the limit of what people actually perceive that I'm doing because I'm always trying to give something and, and I learn a hell of a lot each <laughs> week when I do the research and I'm hoping that I'm passing that on. I'm hoping that listeners listen to the show and they go, huh, well, that's really cool. I never knew that before. Well, you do a great job at that because I know in preparation for this, I was listening to the Area 51 episode uh, yeah. <laughs> and you went into so much stuff that I was like, oh my God. And I was just, you know, jotting down notes and looking stuff up as you were talking about it. And it's, I had no idea. I knew that Area 51 isn't really a crash landing for an alien uh, spaceship. <laughs> but I didn't know what the history was behind it, and I learned it from your episode. And then I didn't know the other things associated with it. And it was just really cool because I did. I gained so much out of you were debunking something, but you were also teaching a lot. Yeah, I mean, de debunking is you know kind of necessary in the way that you have to say, okay, here's what we're going to get past. Okay. Now that we're past that, now let's see what the, what the real facts are. And it's always more interesting because you're, by definition, you're diving deeper. You're diving deeper into the subject and learning way cool stuff that people typically aren't exposed to. Sure. I mean, you, you're, it's not like you're going to turn on the TV and find out what it is that causes people to perceive a ghost in their house. You're going to turn on the TV and be told there's a ghost in your house. Mm -hmm. you and know, the psychology is more important, is more interesting. The, the perceptual errors that the brain makes and the perceptual phenomena that are not errors of the brain, that's all really cool stuff. It is. That is 
almost the exact same reason we started this show. I mean, it was like, okay, there's this easy medium of doing, you know, of, of creating content, talking with people, and you can really learn a lot by not just watching TV or even the news. You know, it's so glamorized or, or just mm-hmm. they try to terrify you. And so when you do this, I mean, you you clearly must be someone who seeks a lot of answers. You wouldn't do that if you weren't. I mean, I know John and I, that's that's what we do. We're like, let's learn from anyone we can. All right, let's do a show around it. So I know that had to be in your makeup from the beginning. Yeah, I think uh, like 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 a lot of you know I'm I'm basically a science writer now. That's that's what my professional title would be. And all the science writers I know, we all came from a childhood where we were thrilled with science fiction and you know reading about Bigfoots and UFOs and aliens and you know the cool stuff, the fringe, the you you know the real cutting edge of 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 what human knowledge is. Of course, the 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 more the more knowledgeable you become in 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 science you learn that the fringe the edge is not the paranormal it's the normal real cool actual science that's going on <laughs> so it, it's super easy for a television show to sell something that's sensational end of story it's a harder job to take facts and to make them competitively sensational that's a really good point. And actually, it kind of, I had this question when I was listening to one of your shows. How the hell do people allow such garbage to be pushed out on the media mainstream? I don't understand. I mean, how is it even legal for a, a cleanse or whatever to say, we cure every disease on the planet? It infuriated me. I, yeah. I, it literally it's, infuriated me. Of course, it's it's not legal. However, Depending on which laws they're violating, the FDA or the FTC, um, both those agencies are absurdly overwhelmed and will never be able to keep up with the amount of crap that's being sold with with illegal medical claims. Um, websites literally pop up overnight, and you've got a limited number of staff of people at those agencies who's in charge of tracking down and sending warning letters, and you know they've got this huge, slow bureaucratic process. And uh, it's it's a hopeless task. So we, we cannot expect um, regulators to clamp down on the pseudoscience. Um, it's a much better strategy to simply give better science education and make people better informed and better able to spot nonsense for themselves. Yeah, I guess I was just I was just about to say that. You know, now that I think about it, maybe the the onus is just on us. I mean, as a consumer and somebody that digests this information, it's your job to know what you're buying, what you're ingesting, what you're believing. And, you know, the real thing you can do is try to listen to things like Skeptoid and Smart People Podcast and whatever it might be (laughs) and educate yourself a little bit. You know, a a great example I I, I like is, um, you know, cream cheese. You buy cream cheese for your bagel at the market. I love cream cheese. It, oh, me too. I could eat it with a spoon. In fact, I often have. <laughs> cream cheese used to be the hard, solid stuff, but now they sell whipped cream cheese. Yep. Somebody decided, let's sell half as much product by simply whipping in some <laughs> air, and we can sell it for exactly the same price. And Now, that's not necessarily bad. The whipped cream cheese is, is great. It's an identical phenomenon to what's happened in the pharmaceutical industry. When you go into, next time you go into a drugstore for any reason, just look Go up and down the cold remedy aisle and look at everything that has the word homeopathic written in tiny letters somewhere on the box. Mm-hmm. The Zyrtec is a company that used to sell a proper cold remedy. And then they started selling alongside it the exact same box, except it said homeopathic on it. Now, of course, homeopathic means that it has no active ingredient in it at all. So as they realize, hey, we can sell nothing for just as much money <laughs> as long as we print the word homeopathic. Zyrtec now no longer sells their proper cold medication at all. They strictly sell literally nothing and they sell it for just the same price. And this has exploded in recent years. When you go into a pharmacy, it's shocking how much stuff says homeopathic on the box. And companies are realizing, hey, there's no need for us to sell anything because people will keep buying it just because it's in a drugstore and on the shelf and says that it's a cold remedy or whatever it is. And this is something that you, the average person has no way to recognize that this is happening. They have no way to recognize that they're being ripped off. The only way to know it is to learn what homeopathic actually means and to have 
a basic science literacy. And that's rare these days. I don't even know where to go with that. It's so, I'm so beaten down. I mean, you know, it's terrifying. It, it is. And I think about my mom, God bless her, but she'll, <laughs> she'll be like, oh, I have a headache. So I just stuck pig snot, uh, you know, like, she'll just make something up that she heard on some. <laughs> on Dr. Oz. Yeah, on Dr. Oz. <laughs> like, and she'll tell me something. I, I was having heartburn issues and she told me something ridiculous. And I go to a specialist who's done this for 30 years. And I say that to him and he's like, Wow, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. Here's a prescription <laughs> medication. You know what I mean? Like that's they they yeah. do these things and they go through so much regulation for a reason. They're not the devil. Like every drug, I don't know. My dad said everything in moderation. I mean, if you do that, I think you can steer clear of a lot of the the garbage. Dr. Oz is is another great example of how far downhill uh, TV, the entertainment industry has gone. He's he's simply selling magically easy solutions. He's a wholesale promoter of alternative medicine. He no longer pretends, as far as I know, he no longer pretends to offer legitimate medical information at all, which is he actually did when he first appeared as a guest on Oprah's show occasionally. But uh, they've realized the business model. Give the audience what they want, which is magically easy solutions to difficult problems. That's what he does. I, I'm sure he does it knowingly. It's, it's just simply that's – they're – the the entertainment industry is an entertainment industry. It's not the health industry. I guess that that was going to answer my next question. Like you, you would hope that people's morals at some point would kick in, but I guess that's that's asking too much. That's the wrong business. It's not. It's not the psychology industry. It's the entertainment industry. Their job is to provide entertainment, and that's why Discovery Channel, Science Channel, History Channel, they're now pseudo discovery, pseudo history, pseudo science. Um, they're selling what's sensational. One of my favorite stories is about TLC, which used to be the Learning Channel. How it was, you know, NASA funded, and it was supposed to provide science shows for children. And mm -hmm. now, like their main show is that Honey Boo Boo show, because it was it was <laughs> bought, it was privatized, and now they want to squeeze every cent out of people. So they're like, oh, what do the people want? They just want to sit and and not have to think at all. So we'll put the most ridiculous stuff out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's incredible. And, and, and this, this is kind of why, um, I mean, this, we've kind of circled around the conversation now because we're, it's bringing me back to the business model that I have for Skeptoid, which is basically the PBS model, the listener-supported, public broadcasting, donation-supported. That's where almost all of the income to support Skeptoid comes from. Um, that way, I'm not the, the the amount of money that I make. It depends entirely upon my performance. If if I slip, if I start to promote BS, um, there goes my income. People are going to stop supporting it as well. They should, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that uh, I'm a strong believer in that model. I was going to say that's probably got to be a really good feeling knowing that you're actually getting paid for your your exact performance. So whatever yes, your consumer, I feel, I, I know that I, every penny that comes in, I know that I've earned it right. very honestly. And that's a great feeling. It's, it's such a cool business model. I mean, so for, for our podcast, I was the one that was interested in the tech behind it. Like I love all the toys, the microphones, the mixers, all that kind of stuff. Me and too. I, I just sit there and think, I was like, Oh my God, I wish I was five or six years older, maybe 10 years older, because I, I was in school, right. When like the podcasts first started coming out and I didn't have really the, the knowledge of, of just buying a USB microphone and, and starting that. But I mean, I love it. It's such a great industry. It's so much fun. And you literally can do it with, you know, $15 equipment, which is great. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's, that's, that's that. how I got started. The secret of my success was not the microphone that I used. You know, I, I, I had whatever ridiculous old microphone that was 25 years old laying around the house, plugged it into my laptop, held it in my hand, and that's that's how I started recording. Nice. <laughs> yeah, the microphones we started out on were, were pretty much a joke. Brian, you know, thanks again so much for being on the show. For our listeners who want to learn more about it, obviously you have Skeptoid, the podcast. Could you uh, let them know how else they can find you, you know, your website, Twitter, things like that? Yeah, Skeptoid, obviously, is Skeptoid.com. 
Um, that's not spelled skeptiot or spectoid or <laughs> that, there's a there's a, a great list of awesome misspellings. But um, I'm on Twitter at Brian Dunning, and you can find me on Facebook at uh, facebooks.com slash skeptoid podcast. I had to think there for a second. Yeah, I don't even know sometimes yeah. our own Facebook thing. So you just type skeptoid into Google. There you are. You found it. <laughs> you know, it we'll let you go. Get back so to your too. family again. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate it. Okay, guys. All right. I'll All talk right, to you later. Right. Thanks. That, ladies and gentlemen, was Brian Dunning. His podcast is Skeptoid. Check him out. He's a good guy. He sat on the phone with us for a little while after the interview talking to us about podcasts and just chatting it up. Teaching us the ways of the OG. Yeah, teaching us his ways. Hopefully one day we'll be, you know, half as successful as him. Yeah. So we're not going to bore you with this long outro. We got some no. good stuff coming up. Subscribe to us. Subscribe to us. Listen to us, you know, weekly or every eight days, <laughs> however often we come out. We're going to try and listen to Brian and do it more on a schedule, but that's all I got to say. And utilize that Amazon page. Later. Later.